Keystone Learning Systems. Welcome to this beginning Windows course. First we're going to discuss some basic computer concepts and then work with the Windows program. We'll learn to run some other Windows programs. In fact, we'll work with multiple Windows. We'll show you how to use some text, use the help system, and practice your mouth skills. First, we're going to talk about some basic computer concepts. We'll talk about the hardware that makes up your system, the software that runs it, and discuss the difference between memory and file storage. There are two basic components that make up your computer system. Hardware, the things you feel, see, and touch, and software. The hardware consists of the physical components that you can see and touch. It acts like a CD player or a tape player. You can have a CD player or a tape player, but until you put a CD or a tape in, it really doesn't do anything. It needs some software for instructions on how to run. Software are the instructions to the hardware how to run and what to do. It is purchased and provided usually on diskette. Sometimes it comes on CD-ROMs instead. It is copied from the disks onto your system's hard disk. Let's talk about the hardware components first. The hardware is composed of several different component parts. It's put together much as a stereo system is put together. Your system unit is the heart of your system. The monitor is plugged into it so that you can see what's going on. And the keyboard is plugged into it so that you can put in information. A mouse many times is also used to put in information. You may also have a printer or a modem attached to your computer. The system unit may be a horizontal unit that we saw in the preceding slide or a vertical unit, a tower. Inside the system unit is a microprocessor chip that actually processes the information. It runs your computer. Also inside are RAM chips. Now, RAM is an acronym. It stands for Random Access Memory. And this is usually what people are talking about when they say, my computer has so much memory. The memory is the workspace, and it does have a finite capacity, but you can add more memory to most systems. The system unit also contains the hard disk. The hard disk is where information is stored or saved. You can think of it as a filing cabinet. It also contains a floppy disk drive that you can put floppy disks in. How do you get information into your computer? One of the most common ways is a keyboard. And you can use the keyboard to type information in. Many times you have function keys at the top that perform specific features that are programmed into the software instructions. A mouse is used a lot in Windows. Many people who have been proficient on a keyboard hesitate with the mouse, but once you get used to the benefits of the mouse, you'll find that it, in many cases, it allows you to do things a lot faster. The best of both worlds is available to you because if you're not a proficient typist, many times the mouse is a lot easier. With graphic programs, the mouse offers definite benefits. But as you continue to work with Windows, you'll find that many times there are keyboard shortcuts that do things even more easily than the mouse. Information also can be put into your computer from disks. Information is stored on the disks, whether they are programs that you purchase or things that you've created, such as letters or spreadsheets. A CD-ROM holds a lot of information, and many of the new pictures, graphics, fonts, and sounds and videos that we use are provided on CD-ROM. 
A modem is another way to get information into your computer. It allows you to receive information over a telephone line. You may have heard of bulletin board services such as CompuServe where you can download or get information that's stored in a remote location down into your computer as well as send it. How do we get information out of the computer? Usually we want to print something. There's several types of printers available today. A dot matrix printer is known as an impact printer and if you need to make multiple copies of things such as invoices, dot matrix printers are ideal. Most people are using laser jets at this point or there's a, a variant of that called a desk jet or a bubble jet printer which is a little less expensive than a laser. This provides you with wonderful quality type as well as the ability to do graphics. Again, you can store information on a disk and send that disk to someone else or take it to another machine. And you also can send information via a modem. How is it all put together? The different components that are attached to the system unit, which we said was the heart of your system, these components are called peripherals. They're attached by cables that look like this. And these interface or connect the various components to the system unit. Everything comes and goes from the system unit. Well, we've been talking about hardware, but you need software to be able to run your system. The three types of software that are required are, first of all, DOS. Now, DOS, again, is an acronym. It stands for Disk Operating System. It actually runs your system. It manages your system resources. It also runs your programs. DOS also provides utilitarian or housekeeping type programs that let you manage your files that you keep on your computer. In addition to DOS, Windows is an operating environment. It doesn't replace DOS, it works with DOS. It provides you a graphical user interface. Again, an acronym, GUI, pronounced GUI. In other words, pictures instead of text. So that instead of having to remember a command that you may type in DOS, you have pictures that explain what can be done and what is available. And you activate them simply by selecting them. The Windows operating environment is a very rich one. And there have been many application programs created to run under Windows. The actual application programs are where you create things. You use the program to create data. Application programs fall into several different categories. Word processors are one of the most popular types of software. These are used for creating text, letters, memos, reports, books. Spreadsheet software is also very popular. When you're dealing with numbers, such as financial statements, estimates, proposals, lists of information, you can use spreadsheets. It's set up for things that are mainly in rows and columns and for numbers that have to be calculated. Spreadsheets also include the ability to be able to graphically portray those numbers so that you can see projected trends. If you need something a little stronger than a spreadsheet, you can use a graphics program. The screen that you're looking at right now, in fact, all these slides that we've been looking at, have been created in a graphics program. And it's for pictures and presentations. Database programs 
also are very popular. These hold information and manage information so that if you are looking for a listing of your customers or your products and you want to create reports, you use databases. There are many other types of application programs, but these are the most common. It's really important that you be able to differentiate between two things, memory and disk storage. When you type things in from your keyboard, they go into RAM, random access memory. And the most important thing you need to remember about that is it's temporary. Anything that's in RAM, if the power goes off or you exit out, it can be lost. You have to save your work on disks. You can think of your disk as a filing cabinet. And Windows is very kind to us when we create things. Let's say we use a word processor to create a letter. When we try to exit out without saving it, it always reminds us, well, what do you want to do with this? And we want to save it on a disk. Think of your disk as a filing cabinet where information is stored. This is a very appropriate analogy. Now, we've pictured a floppy diskette here. These don't have nearly the capacity of a hard disk. A hard disk is usually inside your system unit. But a floppy disk has the benefit of being portable. So rather than think of it as a filing cabinet, I tend to think of it as a briefcase for bringing important files from one place to another. Your hard disk is more like a permanent filing cabinet that you're not going to be carrying around unless you have a little notebook computer or a portable computer. Many times you may have a PC or a personal computer hooked into a remote storage device, a remote hard disk called a server. This is known as a local area network, and it's abbreviated LAN. This is where PCs are hooked together and information is stored on the file server so that you can share information among these other PCs who are hooked in. These PCs can also share peripherals such as printers or modems, and they can send mail or other information to other users on the network. So we said that files are stored on the disk, just as in a filing cabinet. There's several different types of files that are stored on the disk. First of all, there's system files. We talked about DOS, the disk operating system. These are the files that actually run your computer. You don't really have to get involved with them. When you buy a computer, they're usually installed there for you. Also, program files are on your disk. These days, almost everyone uses a hard disk as their filing cabinet where program files are stored, or those program files may be stored on a network server. You use the program files to create data files. In other words, I may have Word for Windows as a program, and I use it to create a letter, which is data. And that data, then, will be stored in a file. Let's take a look at this diagram. Now, here we have a block that represents our hard disk, showing our operating system on that hard disk, those files, and showing Windows on our hard disk. And we have a floppy disk here. And this represents RAM, random access memory. And I always kind of think of it as a cloud. I guess it's not really a cloud. It's composed of hardware chips. However, it, that always reminds me that it is temporary, that that's the most important thing I have to remember. And if I create anything in here and don't save it, it's going to be gone when I come back the next time. When we start our computer, a copy of your DOS operating system files goes into RAM, into memory, and runs your computer. 
when you start the Windows program, a copy of some of the Windows files go into RAM and present you with the Windows interface, which we're going to look at in just a minute. We then can use a program if we want, or there are several programs provided by Windows, um, small programs that are called applets, and you can use those programs to create data. So I'm just going to represent creating some information here. Now remember, we can always get this back because it's on our disk. We can always load Windows again because it's on our disk. But this has to be saved some other place. So we can save it on our hard disk, or we can save it on our floppy disk. And it will create files on those disks. In this first section, we've looked at some basic computer concepts. We've seen some different hardware that's put together to form a computer system, discussed different types of software that runs the system, and differentiated between random access memory, which is temporary, and disk storage, which is permanent. we're going to start and end the Windows program and take a look at some of the Windows screen elements. We'll learn the basics of using a mouse as well as using the menus and dialog boxes. We'll also learn to control window size, use the scroll bar, and arrange our icons and windows. Many computers are set up to automatically take you into the Windows program and that's the first thing that confronts you. Some systems are set up so that Windows is a choice on a menu. If neither of those apply to you, you can always start the Windows program by typing the word Win at the C prompt. Now this C prompt indicates that we are in DOS and this is a command that will start the Windows program. When we press the Enter key, it searches for the Windows program files on our disk and puts a copy of them into RAM. Now your screen may not look exactly like this one. This has a lot of software on it and a lot of different icons or pictures that yours may not have. However, the ones that we're going to talk about you will have in common. Okay. Let's take a look at the screen. Now the gray area around the outside of these windows, and I'm using my mouse pointer to point to these different areas, and we'll talk about how to make the mouse pointer work in a minute, but the arrow is, is moving to different areas based on motions that I'm making with the mouse. This gray area represents the desktop, and the desktop is Windows terminology for RAM and it represents all the things that are in RAM right now. Of course, DOS is in there running our system, and Windows is in RAM running as well. At the top of the screen, you'll notice a title bar. And the title bar says that this is the program manager. The program manager is actually what runs Windows. As long as Program Manager is active, Windows is running. Once Program Manager is closed, you will exit from Windows. Let's talk about the different components of the screen. We have a window called Program Manager, and inside it we see another window called Main. Program Manager is the application window. It represents the software, in this case the Windows program itself. The main window is a document window, a special kind of document window called a group window that allows you to have icons representing programs inside it. So we have two separate windows, but you'll notice they have a lot of things in common. In addition to the title bar, 
They both have sizing buttons to the right, and these allow us to increase and decrease the size of our windows, and you notice them on both windows. And to the left of the title bar, we have something called a control box that allows you to open and close and switch between programs. And we'll be using this control box in a little while. You'll notice they also have borders around all the windows. As we move on to one of those borders, you'll notice that the mouse cursor changes shape into a double-headed arrow. And you'll notice this frequently as we work with the Windows program, that it will change shape. We saw the hourglass when we first started the program. So the cursor always gives us an indication of things that we can do. In this case, we could change the size of Windows, which we'll do in a little bit. Inside the main window, you have pictures or icons which represent different programs which can be run. You'll notice that one of these icons has reverse text shown. This is called highlighting or selecting something. Selecting is a very important concept in Windows, and something is always selected. We'll learn how to change selections in just a minute. In the bottom part of the Program Manager window, you notice icons that look a little bit different. These icons represent program groups, just like the main window. The main window is a program group that's open. These are program groups that are made into icons. And you do that through something called minimizing a window. In other words, minimize is the smallest that it can go. Another element of the window screen is the menu bar. And all application windows have menu bars. With most applications, they will start with the choice called File and end with the choice of Help. Some of the smaller programs that I mentioned that come with Windows don't always have all those choices. Let's talk a little bit now about how to use this mouse. If you pick it up and turn it over, you'll notice there's a little rubber ball that, that kind of hangs down and slides around as you roll it over your mouse pad. Be sure to use a mouse pad. Uh, you don't want to roll it on a piece of paper or anything like that because it will pick up lint. And a dirty mouse is an unhappy mouse and it will start skipping around your screen. You can always open it up and take the little ball out and wash it and put it back in again in case your mouse starts getting temperamental because it has some lint or pretzel crumbs or whatever the case may be inside your mouse. Always remember to pull the mouse pad all the way forward so it's sitting next to your keyboard. Because if you stretch your arm out, to reach the mouse for a long period of time, you'll get a good case of mouse neck, uh, which is a very stiff neck that I got when I first started working with the mouse. You can pick up the mouse anytime you want. So if you're getting close to the edge of your uh, mouse pad, you simply can pick it up and put it down in a different location. It won't move the arrow pointer on the screen uh, as long as the ball isn't rolling. When you lay your hand over the mouse, you hold it firmly by the sides. The reason you hold it firmly is you don't want it to slide when you're trying to click because then you're doing something else called dragging. When you have it held firmly by the sides, your index finger and your next finger fall naturally over the two buttons. Now you may have a mouse that has three buttons. A lot of them only have two. Most activities are done with a left button, although the right mouse button is being used more and more. If you're left-handed, you have the ability to switch the buttons and use your left hand instead. Now we're going to learn some essential mouse skills. We're going to point, click, drag, and double click. Double click's the hardest one to master, but you'll find it's a real time saver in Windows. To get comfortable with working with the mouse, after you've positioned your hand, make some little circles with the mouse pointer, and you'll notice that the arrow moves in response as you circle around. Towards the end of this class, I'm going to show you how you can adjust your mouse settings if you want to, to have it move faster or slower. Now, you can point to different areas of the screen, 
as I did when I was discussing the different parts of the screen, such as the title bar or the sizing buttons. You also can use the mouse pointer to click, and I'm going to click on the minimize button here. Here's what happened. We minimized or made that window into an icon. Minimize, of course, is the smallest that it can be. And the down arrow gives us a clue that it's going to get small. You also use the mouse to click on menu options. And you can click on it again to turn it off. As well as clicking, one of the skills that you'll learn is dragging. With dragging, you hold down the left mouse button, keep it down, and then drag to the new location. And once you've gotten to where you want to be, you just release that left mouse button. So it's point, click and keep the button down, and drag to a new location. You can even drag windows around. Let's point, click, and drag. Now I'm going to take one of these group icons and try to drag it out the top of the window. And you'll notice it didn't let me do that. It limits me and won't allow me to take it all the way out. But also notice that something else happened to the screen. I want you to take a look on the right side and the bottom of the screen. And you'll notice that some new elements appeared. These are called scroll bars. One of the things that may be confusing to new Windows users is the fact that different things appear in certain situations and then disappear in other situations. Scroll bars only appear if there's more to be seen than will fit in the current size of the window. So because we drag these partially up so that not all of them was showing in the window, Windows applied scroll bars for us. We'll learn to use scroll bars a little bit later. If we wanted to rearrange our icons, we could sit here and drag them back into the order where they were before, but that would be very time consuming. The menu provides us with a choice to control the appearance of our windows and our icons. When I click on this menu choice, you'll notice that a drop-down menu appears. And one of the choices on that drop-down menu is Arrange Icons. So we click on that choice, and it automatically rearranges our icons for us. Now we're going to work on another essential mouse skill, double-clicking. This is probably the one that people have the most trouble with. You have to click within a certain period of time twice. And the speed is usually click, 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 click. I want you to practice that double click on an empty area of the screen. You can double click in this empty area. And when you're comfortable with your double clicking, let's come down to this group icon, which represents the main window. And we're going to double click on that. You'll notice that if you click at the correct speed, you will get the main window. But what if you didn't click quite fast enough? I'm going to minimize this again using the Minimize button. And I'm going to click more slowly this time. And you're going to see that instead of it opening the window, and restoring it to its previous size, we've gotten a pop-up menu. Now, this pop-up menu is very interesting because it already has selected the Restore choice, which will restore it to its previous size. You'll notice there's some choices here that are dimmed out or grayed out, ghosted. That means they're not available at this time. Also listed are some shortcut keys 
for these particular activities. We want to restore this icon and open the window, and we have done so. Let's take a look at some other choices that are available to us through the menu bar on the Program Manager window. When we select the file choice, we get a drop-down menu which gives us a lot of options. Again, you'll notice that there are some shortcut keys on the right-hand side. Notice that if you wanted to open something, that the Enter key also opens things. If you wanted to choose from this menu using the keyboard, you can press the letter that's underlined in each of these selections. You can get rid of the menu simply by clicking on the choice again or by pressing the Escape key. The Escape key will still leave this menu bar active. You notice it's still blue, and that means it's selected or active. Let's take a look at the Options menu. The Options control how Program Manager will work, and you'll notice that there's a check mark next to the Save Settings on Exit. A check mark next to a menu selection means that that is turned on. If you want to turn it off, you click one time on it. When we go back and look at options again, you'll notice that the check mark is gone. We're going to turn it back on again by clicking again and the check marks back again. The file menu has a number of choices that have dots after them. These are called ellipses. When you have menu choices that have dots after them, it indicates that you are going to get something called a dialog box. I'm going to select the exit windows choice and take a look at the dialog box that appears. Now this is the simplest type of a dialog box and it has what are called command buttons in it. If we wanted to exit from Windows at this point, we could simply click on the OK button and it would end our session. If we decided that was not a good idea, the Cancel button simply cancels the whole operation and gets rid of the dialog box. We really don't want to get out of Windows at this point, so we're going to cancel this dialog box and the menu choice that produced it. Let's take a look at another dialog box. This dialog box is a lot more complex. It has command buttons over here, but it also has what are called text boxes. Sorry. A text box is a box where you can type information in. In this case, you see the description for the item that was selected. Also notice that some of the buttons themselves have ellipses after them. When they do, it means that you are going to get another dialog box. Now dialog boxes are a way that you can make a number of choices at the same time without having to go through extensive menus. This dialog box presents you with a list of files this is called a list box. Notice that there is a scroll bar here because there are more things than will fit in the window or the list. We can use our scroll bar by clicking on the arrow to move down that list. And as we move down, you'll notice the little box here called the scroll box moves within the scroll bar to let us know our relative position in the list. If we wanted to move up, we would use the up arrow. You can also move to a particular location by dragging, clicking and dragging on that 
box. We'll take a look at some other scroll bars in a little while and show you some faster ways you can work with them. However, I want you to notice the two different types of boxes that are at the bottom. This is called a drop-down list box. And when you have an arrow next to a box, when you click on that arrow, it drops down a box which gives you additional choices. You can then click on them to select them. Let's take a look at this one. And you see that there are a number of different choices that drop down. And we'll be going into several of these dialog boxes and using these different component parts. The objective here is just to let you see the different types of dialog boxes that are available. I'm just going to cancel out of this dialog box, which will take me back to the preceding dialog box, and I'm going to cancel from that one as well. We've already used the Minimize button to make a group window into an icon. Now we're going to work with some other sizing buttons as well as learn how to adjust the size to make a custom size box. We're going to use the sizing buttons on the Program Manager window. Now notice that the Program Manager is not totally covering the desktop at this point. There's still a gray area so you can see the desktop. I'm going to click on the Maximize button. The up arrow expands the size of the window to fill the entire screen. You'll notice, however, once we do that, that the Maximize button disappears. It's no longer available because we're already maximized. In its place is a different sizing button called a Restore button. This button is used to restore Program Manager to its preceding size. Sometimes people click on the Minimize button for Program Manager and then have heart failure. What it does is it minimizes the Program Manager window and everything else was inside the Program Manager window. So we already know how to open an icon by double clicking. We did that to open our main group window. So we'll double click on this and it brings back the Program Manager window. Let's maximize Program Manager again. And then we're going to maximize the main window as well. You'll notice that the main window now fills the entire Program Manager window. You'll notice that the Program Manager title bar is still here, but the main title bar has moved up to the Program Manager title bar, indicating that the main window is filling the entire Program Manager window. Also notice on the right-hand side that we have two Restore buttons now. Whenever you have two sets of buttons like this, the set on the top belongs to the application window in other words, to Program Manager. And the buttons on the bottom belong to the Document window. In this case, the Main window. So if we restore Main, it restores our Main window. Then I'm going to maximize it again. And if we restore Program Manager, notice that Program Manager is restored, but Main is still maximized within Program Manager. It can't get any bigger than Program Manager. Remember when we tried to drag those icons out? This is a subordinate window or a child window. And application windows rule. You can't take document windows outside your application window. And we'll restore the main window also. What if we wanted to change the size of the main window? We can move our pointer onto one of the window borders and click and drag. You'll notice that as we drag, it changes the size of the window. 
it tells us where it's going to be if we let the mouse button go. So we click, drag, release the button. So remember to hold that button down. As long as the button's down, you can change your mind as much as you want. However, once you take your finger off the button, you can't make changes anymore. You have to start over again. If you wanted to change the bottom, Notice we have scroll bars on here now because we've changed the size. Now, using the corner arrow lets us change both of them at the same time. We have a scroll bar because our window is not large enough to let us see all of our icons. We can use our scroll bar to move over to see the additional icons. Of course, once we're over here, the scroll box is over here. Let me make this just a little narrower. We'll scroll this way, and then back again. Now we have a horizontal scroll bar because our icons are spread out horizontally. If we were up here, we also would get a vertical scroll bar. And again, we can scroll vertically. Now, it's a little faster to scroll by clicking in the scroll bar itself above the box. Remember, the box tells you where you are. This says you're all the way to the right side. If you click over here, it moves you all the way to the left side and we'll scroll up so we can see those icons. If we don't like the size that we've created here, we can always return a window to a preset size and position by using a window choice on the menu. I'm going to use Window and Cascade. Cascade returns this window to a uniform size and position in the upper left-hand corner of the Program Manager window. If your icons were all messed up, remember how we arranged those? Let's rearrange the size of this window again. Let's make it a little narrower. You also have the ability to place a window wherever you want by dragging on its title bar. With the mouse pointer on the title bar, you click and hold down the button, and then you can drag that window wherever you want it to be. You also can maximize your window by double clicking on the title bar. And you'll notice that it made it full size. You double click on it again, it maximized Program Manager as well. Double clicking again brought Program Manager back to its restored size. And let's restore the main window. Now we're going to exit from Windows. We've already seen that the file choice always provides us with a way to get out of Windows by choosing Exit Windows. However, let me show you a little shortcut. We're going to click off this menu to get rid of it. And then we're going to use something called the Control Box. You'll notice that each window has its own Control Box. The Application window has a large Control Box with a large handle, and this one's smaller. Because Program Manager is what is running Windows, and we want to exit from Windows, we're going to use the control box here. Now I'm going to click one time first so that you can see the little control menu that is available. And there is a choice of close here, which is equivalent to exiting from Windows. However, I'm going to click off that to get rid of it. The fastest way to exit from a program is to double click on the control box. 
you'll notice that gives us the prompt that says, if you choose this, you're going to go out of Windows. And this time we'll say OK. And that returns us to the C prompt. We are back in DOS and Windows is no longer in memory. If you got into Windows by using a menu choice, it will probably return you to that menu. And we can get back in simply by typing Win again. In this section, we learn to start and end the Windows program and to identify and use different elements of the Windows screen. We practiced our basic mouse skills, used the menu bar and dialog boxes, and learned to control window size and position. We started out with some scroll bars and also learned how to arrange our icons and windows. Now we're going to work with the program manager using its menu and also run some Windows programs. We're going to get some new files and learn how to save data that we've created. We'll learn the rules for file naming and how to open a file that we have already created. We'll also learn how to navigate through directory trees, which are a way that your disk is organized. Notice as we have come back into Windows that it has saved the main window in the size and shape that we last put it. This is because one of the options has been turned on. We had a check mark next to Save Settings on Exit, so that any way that we arranged our icons and our windows in Program Manager would be saved. There are several other options that might be useful. The Auto Arrange will automatically rearrange your icons if you change the size of your window. Minimize on Use will make an icon of Program Manager when you run another program. The Window choice on the Program Manager menu allows us to arrange our windows and icons as well as move to other windows. We'll be working with multiple windows shortly. The Help choice allows us to access the Help feature, search for help on a particular topic, or even use the Windows tutorial, which has some nice information in it about how to use the mouse. The File choice on the menu allows us to create new program groups, copy ones that we already have, or remove them. It also lets us run programs from a dialog box instead of by double-clicking on its icon. We're going to run a program that's in a different program group. We're going to open the Accessories window which contains a number of programs that comes with Windows. We're going to open the Accessories window because we want to get to the programs that are inside of it. Notice it wasn't necessary to close our main window. The new window lays on top of the old window. And we'll work with multiple windows very shortly. But first we're going to run a program. We can run the clock by double-clicking on it. This shows us a clock. We can change some of the settings using the menu. And we can exit from a program by double-clicking on the control box. We're going to use the Paintbrush program now. So we double-click on Paintbrush and it brings the Paintbrush window onto the screen. Now, notice something, which is that Program Manager is still behind here. And this is laid on top. But also notice that this one is not limited by the size of the Program Manager window. Do you see that it's actually outside of Program Manager? In fact, we can maximize Paintbrush, and it will fill the entire screen. 
because this is also an application window. We can identify it as an application because it has a menu bar. We use the application to create a document. I recommend that whenever you're working with an application that you always maximize the window. If you don't, and I'm going to restore this, if you don't, the possibility exists that you may click outside the window that you're working on and the previous window will come and cover this one up. Let me show you how easily something like that can happen. Do you see we clicked outside Paintbrush and now Program Manager has covered most of it up. However, we can bring that back to the front by finding a portion of it that's exposed. We happen to know this is Paintbrush and if we click on it, it brings that one back to the front. So if things ever disappear on you like that, it's because something else has covered it up because you've clicked on it. To prevent that from happening, always maximize your application. Then there's not a chance that you're going to accidentally click on a window that's behind and cover up the one you're currently working on. One of the wonderful things about working with Windows is after you've learned the basics of the Windows screen and how the menus work, they work the same in almost all the Windows programs. You've already used sizing buttons and menus in Program Manager. Now in Paintbrush, we're going to recognize some of the same common elements and use them. Notice that we have a title bar and it identifies that this screen that we're looking at has an untitled document in it. In other words, we haven't created any data that has been saved yet. We have sizing buttons over here that we used and we have a control box over on this side that we can close the program and we have a menu bar. We also have scroll bars on the right side and on the bottom. Now the menu choices are a little bit different but here again they start with file and end with help. We also have options that are particular to this program. So you may see different choices on the menus, but you'll also see some very common ones on the menus that appear in all the programs. Paintbrush has some tools in this toolbox on the left-hand side of the window. Now our objective here is not to learn how to use the Paintbrush program. We'll show you how to use the Paintbrush program in our intermediate course. However, we want you to be able to create data save it and get it back again. To be able to do that, we're picking a program that's a lot of fun to use and that people take to very naturally. The toolbar is shown over here with various drawing tools. One of them is highlighted or selected. Did you notice that when my mouse pointer is over here in the drawing area, it becomes a little dot because it allows us to use the paintbrush. We click and drag and as we keep the button down and drag around it allows us to draw. You can select any of the tools. Let's select a rectangle. Now that it is selected as we move into the drawing area we get a crosshair and we click and drag down and to the left and it draws a rectangle for us. When it's the size and shape we want, we can let go of the mouse button. Remember that we said earlier that one of the principles of Windows is select and then do. You select your tool and then you draw. You select your color and then you draw. This carries forward into all Windows programs. We can select a thicker line. Notice that the mouse cursor changes shape again. The mouse cursor will always give you a clue as to what you're able to do by changing shape. 
let's use a little thicker line and then let's come over here and we're going to use a bright color. Notice that the color palette here shows us which color we have selected. We selected gray, it shows us that, or yellow. How about this one? So we've selected color, we've selected the thickness of the line, and let's select a shape of a circle. And we click and drag to make our circle. You can change colors, select a different symbol, and this time we've selected a circle that was filled in. So we've been drawing, creating just a wonderful drawing here. This is data. This is something that we've created. If we were to exit from the paintbrush program right now, it would ask us, well, what do you want to do with what you've created? We're going to get a brand new drawing. We decided we were just practicing with this one. So we really want to get a new drawing. We're going to go to the File menu and select New. And notice that it tells us that this image, which has not been saved, has changed. And what do we want to do with it? Many Windows programs, when you ask for a new file, will give you a new document window and doesn't bother asking you what you want to do with the old one because it allows you to have multiple document windows open at the same time. Paintbrush is just one of those little applets we talked about and it's limited. It only allows us to have one document at a time in the program. Therefore, it says, what do you want to do with this one? Do you want to save it or not? We'll choose not to save it because we're going to make a better creation. So we're not going to save these changes. And when we say no, notice it's gone. There's no way to get that back. Remember, it's only temporary when it's in RAM. And when we say, no, we don't want to save it, it just erased it from RAM. Now let's draw something that's maybe a little bit more. We'll pick some colors and some shapes. Now this one certainly looks worth saving. So we're going to save this file. The file menu always provides you with a number of choices. We want to save it and we could choose save and you notice the shortcut key that we could have used instead of the mouse. We could have held down the control key and pressed the S. That's a shortcut key that really saves you time if your hands are already on the keyboard. Or we can use Save As to save it under a new name. Now, as it turns out, since this has never been saved before, whether we choose this one or this one, it doesn't really matter. It's still going to take us to a dialog box called Save As because it didn't have a name to start with. Now, this dialog box, as you can see, is very busy, but let's just take it a little bit at a time. You'll notice in this box there are a number of files listed, all with an extension that says BMP. Now, these are file names, and there's a period here between the name and what is called the extension. BMP is an extension that Paintbrush gives to files that you create using it so that it can identify it as one of its files. These are listed here to show you that you already have files with these names. You would not want to use one of these names because these represent files that already come with your Windows program. Some of them are wallpaper. Here are some of the rules that you have to follow when you name files. First of all, you have a maximum of eight characters when you name a file, so you have to be a little creative to make it identify the file. You can use alphabetic or numeric characters, doesn't matter, or you can combine them. You want to avoid symbols, although you can use the underline and the dash. Uh, many of the symbols on the keyboard are not allowed, so you're best to avoid those. 
Here's the biggie. Everybody tries to put a space in a file name, and you cannot have any spaces. If you want to emulate a space, the underlying character is allowed. And of course, try to make them meaningful so that you know what 94 bud means uh, when you come back to get it uh, three months from now. Many programs do assign an extension. We saw that Paintbrush does assign an extension, the BMP, bitmap file. If it does not assign an extension, you may wish to use the extension to group similar types of files. If you do that, you have a maximum of three characters that you can use. Let's take a look at what we've done. We have created data in memory, and it's only temporary, and now we want to save it. We can save it on the hard disk, or we can save it to a floppy disk. This will allow us to get it back again when we want it. I'm just going to give this file the name of sample, which will follow all my rules. Notice that the file name text box already has something in it, and it says asterisk period BMP. The asterisk is what's called a wild card or global character. It stands for anything or everything. When this area of the text box is selected, reverse text the way it is now, anything that you type will replace it. So we'll call it sample. We don't have to add the extension. It will add the extension for us and then we'll click on the OK box. Notice that our paintbrush title bar now displays the name of the file, the name we've given it. Let's say we're going to add a few more things to this. Let's make it really stand out. If we just want to save this, we can use our file, save, and it will update the file on the disk. If we add additional things, remember that the new things that we're adding are only being added in RAM, in temporary memory. The file on the disk does not include this black X. Do you remember the shortcut key to save a file? It was Control and S. And the little hourglass tells us that it's performing the operation. Now the file on the disk and the one in memory are identical. We're going to ask for a new file. Notice that this time it didn't ask us what we wanted to do with the old one because we'd already saved our work. Now we're going to open that file and bring it back again. So we go to the File menu and we use the choice of Open, which will give us a listing of all of our paintbrush files. Now notice we don't see the file we want here, so we have to use the scroll bar these are in alphabetical order, numbers first. So we could use our down arrow key and only move down one at a time, or we could hold that arrow down and scroll. And when you keep it down, you notice it scrolls, or we could drag our little box down until we get to where we want to be. Or we can click in the scroll bar, which moves us down about a page at a time, or up a page at a time. Let's drag this down so that we can see the ones that start with S. Here's our sample file. We click on it one time, and that selects it. And then we can say OK. It opens up the file from the disk and brings a copy into memory so that we can continue to work on it. Let's put some more lines on here. Now let's say we want a new file. Oh, it remembers we've changed this. Do we want to save the current changes? 
Yes. So we now have a new file and it automatically saved the changes. Notice it doesn't give you a chance to save it under a different name or confirm the save. It just does it. We're going to open a file again. We'll open one of the sample files that comes with Windows. Here's a little faster way to open a file. Instead of clicking one time and then clicking on the OK button, you can double click on a file name and it will open it for you. Here's our Arches file. If we make a change to this, when we say we want a new file, we don't want to save the current changes. So we can select No. That's one of our existing wallpaper files. We really don't want to save any changes we might make. Let's go back to the File Open dialog box for a minute. And I'd like you to take a look at some of the other options on this box. Remember, these are drop-down boxes. Right now, it is looking at Drive C, the hard disk. However, if we wanted to save something on Drive A, a floppy disk, we could select that drive. Right now, it's telling us we don't have any files on Drive A, so it's not showing us anything here. Let's change it back to Drive C. So you drop down the box and select it from the list that appears. Now this list box is your directory window. DOS uses a scheme to organize your disk called tree directories. And we're going to take a look at what tree directories are. Tree directories are used to organize your files. Remember we said that your disk is like a filing cabinet. Well, your hard disk is a very, very large filing cabinet. If you had a filing cabinet the size of a room and you just opened up the door and went in and stacked all your files there, pretty soon you couldn't find anything. So DOS provides something called tree directories to allow us to organize our disk in a more efficient way. Tree directories operate like drawers in a filing cabinet. Most times when you use a filing cabinet, you may have a label on the front of the drawer that indicates the contents of that drawer. DOS provides labels and usually when you install different programs, they are installed into different directories or drawers. Also, within those drawers, you may have different sections, like Pendaflix hanging folders. Within those sections, you then store your files in manila folders. So DOS allows us to have drawers for our major categories, such as our programs, and then Pendaflex hanging folders, so to speak, for the different categories of data files that we may choose to keep. And then the files themselves are similar to the Manila folders. And each file, of course, will have a name to identify what it is. With DOS, you can't use the same name twice in the same directory. Let's take a look at this visual representation of tree directories. The top level is usually called the root level, and it's necessary that some of your files be there. When you install programs, though, they're usually installed into their own directories, so that you may have a directory called DOS that has all your DOS files in, one that's called Windows that has your Windows programs in, and maybe one that's called Word or Excel. Data files should always be stored in their own separate directories. You see two separate subdirectories that are under this particular program. Many programs that use a lot of files will create subdirectories under their main directory for other parts of their program. The Windows program is like this, and it separates many of its files into subdirectories under its main directory. In this case, 
we can see by this open file folder that this is the directory that we're looking in right now. The one above it is the root level. The ones below it are subdirectories under the Windows directory. If we double click on those subdirectories, it takes us further down into the subdirectory, and you'll notice there's subdirectories under those. If we want to go back up to the Windows subdirectory, we simply double click on that. If we want to go up to the root directory, we double click on that. Now we need to scroll down to find the Windows subdirectory. We double click on that, and that is showing us the directory where all of our paintbrush files are. We're going to click in the File List box to make it active, and I'll show you a shortcut for searching for a particular file. We're looking for our sample file again, and it starts with an S. Once you make sure that this list box is active by clicking anywhere in it one time, you can type an S and it will zoom immediately to the files that start with S. So we're going to double click on this now so that it brings our drawing back into memory. We're going to make one more change, add another line here, and now we're going to exit from the paintbrush program. We can do that either by using the file, exit choice, or by double clicking on the paintbrush control box. We're going to double click on the paintbrush control box. Now notice it says, wait a minute, you've changed this. Do you want to save these changes? We'll say yes. Now we've learned to use the program manager menu as well as to start and run programs. We've created data and saved it and opened files again. And we've learned how to navigate through directory trees. These are skills that you will do again and again in all Windows programs. section, we're going to discuss once again the differences between application windows and document windows. We're also going to work with multiple windows and learn how to activate them. We'll use the task list to switch between programs and also learn some shortcut keys. Remember that we opened the accessories window, although we already had a window open called main. Now, the program manager window is the application and program manager is what allows you to create program groups. Windows comes with four windows to start with. The main window, the accessories window, the games window, and the startup window. These are each group windows which are a special type of document window. Remember that we found when we tried to pull the icons out of Program Manager that they couldn't come out. And when we try to pull accessories out, you'll notice that it won't come out of the Program Manager window. These are subordinate windows or child windows of the application. When we worked in Paintbrush, we found that we could only open one document window at a time. However, programs like Word and Excel Lotus 1, 2, 3 for Windows all allow you to have multiple document windows open at the same time. In addition to that, you can have multiple programs running at the same time and switch between them. Let's move our accessories window up a little bit back towards where it was. You'll notice that the accessories window, because that's the one we're working with right now, the title bar is dark. The main title bar is light because it is an inactive window. If we click in the main window, it brings it to the front and makes this the active window. Notice that the accessories title bar is now light. If we open another window, and here's the games window, 
it always is restored to its previous size and shape inside the program manager window. However, it's covered up our accessories window now, but we could bring accessories to the front by clicking on it. Once you start to have windows layered on top of each other like this, sometimes it becomes difficult to find a portion to click on, such as the main window right here. When you're working with several programs at a time, you may want to cascade them in the upper left hand corner so that you can see all of their title bars easily. The window command on the menu allows us to arrange our windows. Let's try the cascade choice. You'll notice it stacks our windows in a waterfall effect so that you easily can see the title bar and switch to that if you want to. Well, now our accessories window is hidden and we don't see the title bar, but if we click on any exposed surface, it comes to the front. But what if the accessories window was maximized and we couldn't see any of the other windows and we wanted to switch to one? We can always get to a hidden document window by using the window choice on the menu. You'll notice that Accessories has a check mark next to it, showing that this is the active window right now. We want to move to the main window. So we find it on the list and click one time. And it brings the main window to the front. Notice that it also is restored. Let's do that again. We'll move to Games. You also can activate group windows that are not open, such as here's one for Microsoft Office. And this opens to show us the program icons for many of the Microsoft products. We're going to restore that window, and then we'll just minimize it. With group windows, because they are not exactly the same as document windows, you also have the choice of using the control box to minimize it. Let's maximize games, and instead of going through the two-step process to restore and then minimize, we can double-click on this control box. Now you have to be a little careful when you do this because you notice you have two of them right next to each other. The one on the top belongs to the program, program manager. The one on the bottom belongs to the document window. And we'll double click on that. And it closes that window. Here's games down here now. But what if we wanted to do some work where we wanted the main window and the accessories window to be side by side? There's another choice on the window menu called tile. When you tile, you have the screen divided into as many windows as are open. We only had two windows open, main and accessories, so it divided it between those two. If we had left games open, it would have divided it between those three. Let's mess up our icons here a little bit. And maybe we want to rearrange our icons. So we go into Window and Arrange Icons, and you notice it goes immediately and arranges them in the main window. If we wanted to arrange icons in the Accessories window, we would first have to activate this window by clicking in it. When we click in it, that title bar becomes blue, and when we choose Arrange Icons, these icons are the ones that are arranged, not the one in main. Remember we talked about select and then do. When we select, that's the one that the activity is going to be done to. Now perhaps we want to open up our games window again. And we can't see it because it's covered. We'll go back to our window menu, and we'll find games on that list. 
and now we'll tile these and it divides it into three this time. I'm going to close the games window in the main window and I'm going to cascade the accessories window so we can see more of the icons. Let's arrange them. Now perhaps I want to start a program and I'm going to start the clock program by double clicking on it. Now this is a separate program. This is not a document window. In this case if we were to minimize it would not become a group icon. When we minimize I'm going to shorten the program manager window here just a little bit so you can see what happened. And you can see your clock here on the desktop. One of the great things about Windows is that you have the ability to start several programs at the same time and easily switch between them. In fact, you can even copy things between them. The clock program is here on the desktop, indicating that it is still in memory. It has not been closed. However, we're going to go and open up something else. Let's open up our calculator. Now here's an application that you can use to do quick calculations. And we may want to keep it on our desktop also so that we can use it easily. We'll minimize it, and the icon goes to the desktop. And some of the other things you may have on your desktop might be a Rolodex, a card file. And we'll minimize that to put it on the desktop. Or a calendar to schedule appointments. And we'll minimize that and put it on the desktop. Now you notice a difference. When we closed program groups or minimized program groups, because they were subordinate to Program Manager, they stayed inside the Program Manager window. However, when you minimize programs, they go to the desktop. If you want to activate any one of them again, you simply double click on them and they are activated. Now here's the difference. We're going to use the control box on the calculator to close this program, to remove it from our desktop, take it out of RAM. So we double click on the control box and that program is no longer in memory. Let's do it again with our clock. And it's no longer in memory. What I'm going to do now is maximize the program manager window. We can no longer see our desktop, so we really don't know what is on our desktop, what is open. But we have the ability to switch to a program called the task list that will give us information about what is on our desktop. We go to the program manager control menu, and if you click one time on the control box for the program, you'll see a choice at the end that says Switch To. This pops up something called the task list. The task list always shows you all the open programs that you have on your desktop. Program Manager, of course, is here. It has to be here, or Windows wouldn't be running. And here we see our card file and our calendar. We can select card file, and the Switch To button will allow us to switch immediately to the card file. You notice it becomes active on top of Program Manager, but you have to be careful because remember, if you click on the Program Manager, card file disappears. Program Manager is now overlaying it. To get back to it again, we would go to our control box, switch to, and select it from the list. Now, a faster way to select our card file, instead of selecting here and clicking on the Switch To, 
is simply by double clicking like we do on file names. So we'll double click to activate and now card file is in the beginning again on top of program manager. I'm going to minimize card file again. Let's say that we were working in an application and we remembered that we had to call someone to set up an appointment. We could use our task list. Now I'd like you to take a look at the speed key for getting that task list. Holding down the control key and pressing the escape key at the same time will immediately give you the task list without having to come up here to the control box menu. So I'm going to hold down the control and press the escape key. It brings the task list onto the screen. I can bring up my card file, which is similar to a Rolodex, and look up the telephone number of the person I want to call. Now I'm going to want to get my calendar so that I have the ability to set up an appointment. Now we're seeing these all on top of each other again. We could grab it by the title bar and just move it out of the way if we want it. Or we could tile. However, here's a little trap. Before we use the window choice, but tiling a window in this instance means tiling document windows, windows that belong to a program. You notice that it has switched us to the program manager window and our other two are behind it. Our window choice here also does not offer the choice, even if we go into our more windows and look at additional programs that are on here, different additional program groups, we can't get to those other programs. However, we can use our task list, control escape, we'll open up our calendar again, and we'll also open card file. And we have card file, calendar, and program manager, which are three separate programs running. If we want to see all of these side by side, we have to use the task list. So we'll use control escape one more time. And here are our choices. Let's tile. And even though this is visually a little confusing, you'll notice this one is the card file, which was active at the time we did this. Here's the program manager window, and here's the calendar window. Rather than tiling, you can also cascade, which will stack them in that waterfall manner that we talked about before. So we're going to cl really close card file this time instead of minimizing it and we'll really close calendar. And we'll drag the program manager window back to a, a better size and shape and move it up a little bit. Usually when I work with program manager, I usually leave it at this size so that I can see things that are on the desktop that I do have running when I'm in program manager. We have our accessories window open. I'm going to open up games and I'm also going to open up the startup window. Now the startup window you'll notice doesn't have anything in it. It comes with your Windows program, but what it does is if you have program icons in here, when you start Windows it will start that program automatically. You have to set it up. Now with this one maximized, Again, I could use my window choice to go and find my other windows, but I also can use my control plus my tab key. And my control tab will tab me through all of the program groups, even the ones that were icons. Using the control tab, you keep your control key down and continue to hold it down as you press the tab key. 
Let's restore that. And we'll activate the accessories window. Now I'm going to open Write, which is a small word processor, and we'll minimize that. We'll open the calendar, minimize that, and the card file, and minimize that. And now, let's maximize accessories and maximize program manager. Now if I wanted to get to my write program, I could use my task list, but I also can use my Alt tab. You hold down the alternate key and keep it down and then tap on the tab key. You notice that it takes you to the first application, write. Keeping the Alt key down, you can press the tab key again. It takes you to the next one, the calendar, and to the next one, card file, and then back to program manager. You notice that it only moved between open programs whether they were minimized or not. I'm going to put us into write and now possibly we might want to look something up from our card file. So I'm going to do an alt tab again until I get to the card file and it opens it and lays it above this one. If this were maximized when I did alt tab this time it will take me back to write. It always goes back to the last one that you previously were in before it then continues to the other open program windows. And we're going to close write and close card file and we'll restore accessories and program manager and we've still got calendar open down here on the desktop. Now if you want to close it, you can click on it one time. You don't have to open it all the way and close it using this little pop-up menu. And let's cascade our windows again, our document windows. So the main thing that you want to remember here is that the window choice on the program menu only controls document windows, documents that were created using that program. So we can use the window choice to control the layout of these windows or to move to them because they all were created by Program Manager. However, if we move to a separate program, you'll notice there's no window choice on here. But we have two separate programs running now, Paintbrush and Program Manager. So if we want to be able to switch between them, we have to use the task list. And the task list can be accessed through the control box or through the speed key, Control Escape. And we're going to close Paintbrush. You can end a program that's running simply by clicking on the End Task button. Something you want to watch out for is sometimes people will start a program running, minimize it, forget they have it running, and when they want to use it again, open it a, separate, a second time. And you'll notice we now have two copies of Paintbrush running. This uses up system resources and memory big time. So you want to be sure if you already have the program running that you activate the one that's minimized, not open it up again. Many of the larger programs will not allow you to do this. They'll tell you it's already running. And we'll clo close this one. And we'll minimize or close all of our program groups. Now in this instance, we did not have any other windows open, so when we arranged our icons, it arranged our group icons for us. If we had this open, it wouldn't work on these icons. It would work on these icons because this is the active window, the window that's selected. 
it's important that you distinguish between the type of windows that you want to control, whether they are application windows, programs, or document windows which you created using the program. We've worked with both application windows and with document windows. And working with those multiple windows, we've used the task list as well as shortcut keys. Now we're going to work with text. We're going to distinguish between the mouse cursor and the insertion point. Learn how to insert and delete text as well as select text and replace it. We'll use a wonderful Windows tool called the Clipboard and we'll also see how you can access the printing features of Windows. Let's open the Accessories group. And in the Accessories group we have two programs that let us deal with text. One is called Notepad and this is a very simple, very rudimentary Notepad that lets you create what are called ASCII files. ASCII files are the lowest common denominator of files that programs use to be able to exchange data from one program to another. The other program that deals with text is the Write program. And the Write program is a mini word processor. We'll open up the Notepad program. Now notice that there are two different elements on the screen here. The mouse cursor has now changed into something called an eye bar. You may have noticed it do that before when we typed in a file name. Whenever the mouse cursor is somewhere where it wants you to put in text, it changes to an eye bar or an eye beam. The insertion point is just like a cursor. It shows you where the next character that you type will go. Windows uses a vertical cursor instead of a horizontal one. I'm going to type my name here and then hit the Enter key a few times. You'll notice that as I typed, the insertion point moved along. And when I wanted to insert a new line, I simply hit the Enter key and it moved down. If I wanted to reposition the insertion point, I can do so using the mouse cursor, the I beam, simply by clicking somewhere. You see that it moves the insertion point to that location? or I can use the arrow keys on the keyboard. I can use the left arrow key, the right arrow, the down arrow key. I can use the home key to go to the beginning of the line and the end key to move to the end of the line. I can move to the beginning of the document with control home. And I can move to the end of the document by holding down Control and pressing End at the same time. These are common cursor movements in all Windows programs. You can also move a word at a time by holding down the Control key and pressing your right arrow key. You can move back by using your left arrow key. Using the mouse to position the insertion point, you can insert additional text. I can put my middle name in here. And you notice that as I typed it in, this text moved over to accommodate it. If I made a mistake while I was typing, I can use the backspace key, which is just above the Enter key, to back up and erase those characters. If I were on this side of the word and I wanted to get rid of it, I would use the delete key because the delete key pulls in characters from the right hand side.
As you can see, I need to know the backspace and delete keys because I make typo errors all the time. Another thing that you can do to insert additional space is to just simply press the Enter key. If I decided I wanted Keystone Learning Systems on three lines, I could position my insertion point and press the Enter key, and it would start a new line every time I press the Enter key. If I backspace, it removed that hard carriage return that I got by pressing the Enter key. In this, in this situation, I'm going to press the Delete key because it's going to delete that hard carriage return that exists at the end. One of the key things that you do when you work with text is select things. You can select things by double clicking. Double clicking will select a word at a time. You can select things by dragging across them. In this case, I dragged down and it selected everything. If you just wanted to start here, you could select. If I wanted to select from here to the end of the line, I can click here and then hold down my shift key and click at the end. That marks the beginning and the end of the area that I want to select. Whenever I click anywhere else, the selection goes away. Let's say that I wanted to delete this word. I select it and then press the delete key. Well, maybe I changed my mind. That wasn't such a good idea. Almost all Windows programs have the ability to undo the last thing that you did. It's under the Edit menu. So if I select Edit, you see that Undo is available to me, and it brought this back. When you have text selected, you can replace it by just typing the new information. If you decide you didn't like that, of course we can undo. Notice that there is a speed key if you want to use the keyboard to undo. One of the most powerful features of Windows is the ability to copy things to something called the clipboard and then paste it into different parts of the same document or other documents or even into other programs entirely. Let's select. Remember, everything always starts with selecting. When we go to the Edit menu, these items which were dimmed out before are now available to us because we have something selected. Again, notice there are speed keys over here. We're going to choose Copy. Now it doesn't look like anything happened, but everything that was selected went into the clipboard. Let's go to the end of our document. We position the insertion point and then we paste it at that location. When we choose Edit this time, you'll notice Cut and Copy are dim because nothing's selected, but Paste is definitely available. And here's a copy. If we wanted to undo that, we can do it easily through the Undo. Let's try this one. And this time, instead of copying, we're going to Cut and Paste. When you want to move something, you can cut it from one location and paste it into another. Now it looks like it disappeared entirely, but it is in the clipboard. And we'll go to Edit and Paste, and here it comes back again. Of course, you may have to make some adjustments, deleting some extra spaces when you do things like this. Whatever you copy to the clipboard remains in the clipboard until you cut or copy something else there or until you exit from Windows. We're going to copy this to the clipboard. Now, you'll notice we haven't given this a title, so we're going to save this file.
again, that same Save As dialog box appears, listing the drive that we're using, the directories that we are using. In other words, the Windows directory is the file folder that's open right now. It's showing us other files that have this extension, txt. Remember, our paintbrush files had BMP extensions. Notepad files use the extension txt. Now, it's only showing us files with that extension because of this little box down here. It says, save files as type text files, txt. When we use this drop-down button, you'll notice that we really have a lot more files here. Look at all of them, because now we've used these wildcards to say, show me any file that starts with anything and that any extension that they're using. Let's change it back to only see txt files. And now it says, show me everything that has the extension txt. Because we've played around with this and clicked on other areas, this is no longer blue or selected. So if we want to make this the active area, we either have to click in it to activate it, or the preferred method would be to double click. When you double click, it selects it or highlights it so that anything that we type in here will now replace this. And I'm just going to use my first name. And I'm going to say, OK. Well, maybe I want to sign somebody else up for this Windows beginning class. This time, when I save this file, I don't want to save it under my name. So instead of using Save, I use Save As. This provides me with an opportunity to change the name. It's showing an entire list or path of where this file is going to be saved, starting on the C drive, going down through the Windows subdirectory, and then the name of the file. We don't really need all of that. We'll just type Gregory in here, replacing the rest of it. We've followed all our file naming rules. And we'll say OK. When we say we want a new file, we get a new one immediately because we've already saved our work. If we hadn't saved it, it would remind us to save it. Notice there is no window choice on the Notepad menu. This is a clue to you that it can only handle one document at a time. Now let's open a file, and here we have my file. We'll double click on it and bring it in. And now let's open Gregory. Because we didn't make any changes in my file, it allowed us to replace the other file with this one. Now we've made a change to Gregory's file. Let's try and open my file now. Oops, it gives us a message. You've already changed this. Do you want to save these changes? We'll say yes. And then it says, well, now what do you want to open? And we'll open my file. With Windows programs, the printing commands are all under the file menu. This is where you select the printer you want to use, change the page layout, as well as actually send it to the printer. You can see that there are three separate commands here. These two remind us that there will be a dialog box which follows. However, if we were to click on the print command, we would immediately start to print. We'd like to take a look at our print setup first to make sure we have the correct printer selected. Right now, we're using this printer. And this is the printer that we want to use. 
if we wanted to change to another printer, we would click on this option button. Now this is something we haven't encountered before, but this is something you'll see a lot of in dialog boxes. With option buttons, only one of them can be selected. So if you click on this one, this one is turned off automatically. Then you can use your drop-down list to select which printer you want. We're actually going to leave it at this printer, so we'll just close this back up and go back to our default printer. This controls whether it's going to be printed in a regular 8.5 by 11 portrait format or turned sideways. And the little picture always gives you a clue as to which is portrait and which is landscape. It uses ordinary 8.5 by 11 paper, but you have the ability to use legal paper, special executive size paper, as well as envelopes or a special size that you may define yourself. You may have a printer that automatically feeds sheets or feeds envelopes, and you can select these if they're available to you. We're going to say, OK, this is the printer we want to use. And now we're going to take a look at the page setup. This is where you would change your margins. Now, Many of the larger Windows programs have a lot more choices than this in terms of what you can do in the way of margins or headers or footers. This is a very, very simple program. However, a header is something that prints at the top of every page. And this is a special symbol here. This ampersand with the F next to it says print the name of the file at the top of every page. The footer always prints at the bottom of every page. And it says print the word page and the page number at the bottom of every page. So these are special codes that Windows sends to the printer telling them to print certain things. This all looks OK to us as it stands with our margins the way they are. So we'll say OK there. Now that we've done all of those, we can print. It's now printing our text. Remember that we copied the Windows beginning text to the clipboard. We're now going to exit out of Notepad and go into our calendar and paste a reminder in there to be sure to watch our Windows beginning tape. We're going to exit out of Notepad. Everything was saved. And we'll go into our calendar. And let's say we'll paste it right here. We get an insertion point. Now look how similar these menus are. We know right where to go. We go to the Edit Choice, and we paste. And it came from the clipboard into this other program. And we'll just close that. And no, we won't save the changes. We've worked with some of the basics of editing text. And you'll find that it works in a very, very similar manner in all word processing programs. We controlled where the insertion point went using the cursor and the mouse. We inserted and deleted text, selected text and replaced it, and used the clipboard. And finally, we did send it to the printer. Windows has a very extensive help feature that allows you to look up information online as you go along. We're going to show you how to find definitions and different topics, search for particular things, set bookmarks, and add a custom note. Maybe we wanted to look up some information on something that we don't do every day. We can get a table of contents and look from there, or we can search particularly on a certain topic. Let's look at the table of contents. I'm going to maximize this so that you can see everything. Now, all of the topics are listed here. And everything that has a solid green line like this is a topic. You notice a little fickle finger of fate here uh, as you point to different topics. If you click on that, it takes you to another screen and gives you additional topics that you can look for. You can always back up where you came from by clicking on the Back Up button.
On this screen, you see something a little different. You see a dotted underline under scroll bar. Let's click on that and up pops a definition just in case you don't know what a scroll bar is. When you click again, it goes away. A group icon is underlined with a dotted line so you know that you can get a definition of that as well. Let's go back. Once you've gone back as far as you can, the button becomes unavailable to you by dimming out. You also can search for a specific topic alphabetically instead of going through several layers of menus. Let's say I wanted some additional information about icons. I can type an I and move immediately to the information on icons about arranging them, changing them, or creating them. I'm going to select changing the icons. When I double click on that topic, it goes to the bottom and I can go directly to that topic by clicking on the Go To button. Here it takes us to the information that's available on how to change an icon. Maybe this is something that I do often and I want to come back again and again. I can set a bookmark to come back to this easily. I go to bookmark and choose define. By default it uses the name of the topic as the bookmark name, but you can change that if you want. We'll leave it at that and say OK. Now let's move to another screen and let's say we want to go back to our bookmark. We click on bookmark and any bookmarks we have defined will appear here on the list. By clicking on it, we go immediately to the information we want. It's giving us all kinds of information, but it doesn't have a piece of information that I looked up someplace else. So we'd like to add an additional note to this. We go to the Edit menu and choose Annotate. is something that I always forget the name of this file and so I want to save it right here where it's talking about change icons. Notice that next to changing an icon there's a little paper clip and when you click on that paper clip up comes your note. If there's something that you use infrequently but that you don't want to have to look it up again and put it right into Windows Help. We can exit from help the way we would exit from any program by double clicking on the control box. If you think you're going to be using help frequently, you may want to minimize it. Put it down on your desktop so that you can get that information at any time by using your task list. We're actually going to close it. Isn't it great to be able to get all that information right on your computer? definitions, search for topics, set a bookmark so you can go back to things you need frequently, as well as add your own personal notes. You can print any of the topics that you want to have a hard copy for under the file command, just like all other Windows programs. Now we're going to show you how you can customize the mouse to fit the way you like to work as well as show you a fun way that you can practice and polish your mouse skills. The accessories window mainly contains little programs that you might use, things that you might keep on your own desktop. The main window, on the other hand, contains the things that control the settings for Windows. The control panel contains a lot of different choices for how you set up your program and we cover a lot of those choices in the advanced tape. However, the one we're interested in here is the mouse. Now the mouse tracking speed is how fast it moves across the screen when you move it on the mouse pad. When this is set slow, 
you can move your mouse very far on the pad and it only moves a small distance on the screen. However, when you move it fast, you can see that even though you move a small distance on the pad, it moves very fast on the screen. And people who are new to Windows sometimes lose their mouse. So I recommend that you set it a little towards the slow side until you get used to it and then you might want to speed it up a little. The other thing that people have problems with is the double click speed. You want to find what your natural double click is, either fast or slow. And use this little test to double click on it at a comfortable speed to you. If you're finding that you're clicking and it isn't working, set it a little slower and try it again. And you can see that even though I'm clicking slower, it's allowing me to activate. Now, the problem with setting it real fast is you have to click really fast to be able to get that one to work. In fact, if you set it all the way up there, most people can't even click fast enough to make it work at all. So I usually leave it set about halfway, and that's a good speed for me for clicking. If you're left-handed, you do have the ability to reverse these buttons. And this is another part of a dialog box that we haven't seen yet. It's called a checkbox. A checkbox is activated by clicking on it, and the little X comes to show this feature is turned on. Now, if you do this, uh, just remember, clicking with your left mouse button isn't going to turn it off now. Only your right mouse button is going to work. So you have to click with the right mouse button to turn it off. Mouse trails, as you can see, they're not active in this dialog box. They're grayed out. Um, but on notebook computers, where it's very hard to see the mouse pointer sometimes, you can set it up to have little trails of mice uh, follow behind the pointer so that you don't lose it. Once you have it set the way you want it to be, you want to be sure to use the OK button to exit from this dialog box. If you were simply to double click here and close it, it would cancel any settings that you had made. One of the program groups that's included with Windows is something called games. And most of us find that a very easy place to practice our mouse skills. We're going to close our control panel. And we're going to go to our games group, which is over here. Open that up. And usually you'll see Solitaire and Minesweeper. It depends on when you bought your program, which uh, games are included. And of course, you can always buy more games. We'll take a look at Solitaire, because that's always included. Now, here's how you can practice your mouse skills here. You can drag the ace up to the top, click to turn over another card. You can drag your five onto your six and drag your six onto your seven and turn these over. And a faster way to get your cards to the top is just to double click on them. And then you can just turn over your cards the way you normally would when you play solitaire just by clicking to run through the pack. So this is an easy way to practice your clicking and your dragging and your double clicking. You have a number of choices here of dealing a new game, changing the deck, you see there's a lot of choices here, and you also can set up scoring options and a status bar and how many cards you draw. You already know how to use a lot of these. Here's a lot of option buttons, and here are your different uh, option boxes. And we exit out of Solitaire the same way we would exit out of another program by double clicking on the control box. And we'll minimize that and cascade main. And it looks just like it did when we started. I'm sure that all of you will have a lot of fun practicing your mouse skills. In this course, we learned basic computer concepts as well as how to work with the elements of Windows that are common to all programs. We learn to work with multiple windows and programs, how to edit text, and how to use the help feature. In our next course, you'll learn how to use the accessories that we just looked at today, as well as how to use the file manager to manage your disk. It's been a pleasure developing this course, and thank you for choosing Keystone Learning Systems.